Welcome. My name is Olav Vassavoose, and I am the coordinator of the Studium Generale Gent. And it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to our, how many at sixth of this year? I'm looking at Helena. Sixth? Sixth, 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 sixth. Sixth uh, Studium Lecture of the 2022-23 Studium Generale uh, ser Lecture Series. Before we get on with tonight's inspiring lecturer, lecturers, uh, first a quick introduction of what the Studium Generale Gent is, for some of you who don't know. Um, our theme for this year, uh, for those of you who haven't heard it many times before, and also a proposal for the tone and the mood of our gathering tonight. Bear with me. This always takes a little bit longer than most people expect, 10 to 15 minutes, so get hydrated. <laughs> Goed. The Studium Generale Gent is a whole Gent course and a public program that invites its audience, you, to discussions, debates, and critical reflections on society art, culture, and science. We do so by curating and hosting 10 lectures each year centered on a specific theme. Well, for this year's theme, we have chosen future ecologies. Let me explain. And to do so, I will first quote Malcolm Ferdinand in his uh, amazing book, Decolonial Ecology in which he introduces us to the so-called great divide. In anthropology, there is this thing that they call the great divide, and he explains us that it's this. It is the dualistic opposition that separates nature and culture, environment and society, establishing a vertical scale of values that places man, preferably white heterosexual male, above nature. It is revealed through the technical, scientific, and economic modernizations of mastering nature, whose effects are measured in the extent of the pollution of the earth, the loss of biodiversity, the disruption of the climate, and in the measure of gender inequalities, social misery, and disposable lives that are engendered. We take great inspiration out of the decolonial call for the rejection of this separation from man and nature. And therefore, we seek to explore future-orientated ways of thinking, propositions, and imaginings which presuppose the intertwining of humans with their environments and their non-human neighbors. Humans as part and not masters of ecological systems which are defined as, as dynamic life communities of living organisms and their physical environments, which includes both biotic and abiotic factors. So, Studium Gent invited thinkers, doers, researchers to share with our audience, you, their learned and creative visions of the future of the ecological systems that house us, enable us, threaten us, and also change our societies. Our guest speakers tonight are Isabelle Fremo and Jay Jordan. And is it Isa and JJ, or is it Isabelle and JJ, or is it Isa and Jay? Isabelle and Jay? Okay, <laughs> okay let's not trigger you. <laughs> Isa, Isa, Isa and JJ. Uh, they live together on the ZAD in Notre Dame des Landes and they both co-facilitate the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. The Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination brings together artists and activists to co-design and deploy creative forms of direct action, which aim to be as joyful as they are politically effective. Creation and resistance, protest and proposition, they are intertwined in their practice. But before we hear from JJ and Isabel, I want to from Is and Isa, I want to say a few words about the tone we strive for at all of our studium lectures. We are cognizant that the topics that we will be addressing can and sometimes will elicit intense thoughts and feelings. 
We believe that a collective commitment to the intention of care can help us shape the tone and perhaps even the beauty of our gathering this evening. We understand the intention of care to be multidimensional, meaning three dimensions. One, the intention to be caring towards our speakers, the intention to be caring towards each other, and the intention to be caring towards yourselves. How are we caring towards a speaker or speakers? Well, at Studium General, we think it is important to always keep in mind that speakers are always guests that we have invited to speak and share their ideas, their research, and their ambitions for a better future. We ask you to help us extend the warmest hospitality to our guests. And that ki the, the kind of hospitality that we think of is the a kind of hospitality that allows them to be vulnerable with us. Vulnerable in their feelings and in their thinking. Vulnerable enough to make mistakes, to perhaps not have the courage to have all the answers, uh, perhaps not to use the best terms or words at all times, perhaps vulnerable enough to have made a choice about what they want to talk about and what they don't want to talk about. Vulnerable enough to say no, to say yes, to say maybe. Right? We need you to help us create that kind of environment for them. As for the intention to take care of each other, we think of it as being full of care in how you address each other and how you hear each other. Perhaps it is helpful to keep in mind that the studium lectures are, above all things, pedagogical in nature, and it is sound pedagogical practice to respect each other's dignity believe in each other's earnestness, nurture each other's curiosity, feed each other's desire to learn. And last but not least, we encourage you to practice care for yourselves. Pedagogical spaces require us to practice self-care in the form of introspection, in the form of being curious about the pain, the discomfort, the friction we're experiencing. So it's, you know, there's this common term of sitting with the discomfort. I think that in pedagogical spaces, it goes beyond sitting with that discomfort. It's really being, studying it, being openly curious about that discomfort and asking yourself what worldview or s view of the self is endangered now in this space, space? And is it truly endangered? And how did you come to acquire this particular uh, view of yourself or of the world, right? In summary, we ask you to be full of care for our guests, for one another, and also for yourselves. Okay, it's time for what you all have come for, and that is Isa and JJ, who take on two questions that really kind of challenge, perhaps even undermine art as we know it and its practitioners. And those questions are, what is art for and who is art for? JJ and Isabel and Isa will share us with us their vision of art and activism that is firmly committed to the protection and regeneration of life. Please welcome Isa and JJ with open, warm, and caring hearts and minds. Come. Thank you so much for such a, a beautiful opening, and thank you very much for being here. I'm supposed to keep you waiting whilst Jay is... Okay. So we're going to just start with a little ritual. Um, we wanted to burn these bay leaves, um, which come from a tree that should have been a runway of an airport. Um, but we were told that the lovely Mikhail, who's done all the tech for us, would lose his job if we did that. So we're not going to, I mean, you know, no one should ever work. But um, so, yeah, so and we're not going to do that. Or as Abby Hoffman said, revolution is screaming theater in a fire. <laughs> you don't get that joke in Flanders, but 
Well, that's fun, very funny when we're eating lunch. Anyway, at dinner. Happy Valentine, anyway. Um, uh, it's another day that the Christian church stole from us pagans, uh, us earth lovers. It's just like they stole Christmas, they stole Halloween, they stole Easter. And poor St. Valentine, this is St. Valentine, he's had better days, um, he, he never intended to have a day named after him. Uh, well, not a day about love. He happened to be the saint of epilepsy. Um, but Chaucer, English medieval poet, wrote a poem about a parliament of birds. Um, and in it, talked about St. Valentine's Day and birds mating. And then the kings and the priests and theologians said, oh, great, let's use that day. Uh, now it's just another day to sell us shit uh, for capitalism, uh, normally useless heteronormative shit. Um, and we totally forget that actually it's a day that has origins in the, the wheel of, of, of life. Uh, it's a, it was a pagan, part of a pagan celebration of the moment where you just start to feel the sun coming back. That moment when the seeds are in the body of the earth and they start to kind of go, mm, we're going to come out for spring. Um, it's another day in the cycle of life and death of the year. And we're really delighted to celebrate St. Valentine's Day with you and thank you for coming here for our date. Um, uh, and we're delighted because we're very interested in Eros. Um, Eros was not a god, way more powerful than the god, couldn't even represent Eros, more than a god, was a, a force. It was actually, in Greek mythology, the force of desire, the force of desire that created the world. And so we've been invited to talk about future ecologies by Helena and Olaf. And um, for us, any future ecology should have Eros weaving straight through it. Um, it can't be an ecology of techno fixes. Of, uh, it can't be an ecology of machines. Uh, it's got to be an ecology of bodies. Bodies that feel alive on the inside. Bodies that are very different from machines because bodies die. It's what uh, someone who's been very important to our work recently, uh, well, the last few years, uh, Andreas Ferber, he's a, a, um, a biologist and a philosopher, and he calls it erotic ecology. He, he termed this term erotic ecology. And he says, without attachment, there is no life, and all the processes in the biosphere are processes of relationship. And in these processes, what happens is different positions are brought into a balance, and at that moment, something new emerges. And that happens at every scale. And it's not about, eros, erotic ecology is not about sex. It's more about the sensuality and the touching and the transforming of others to become yourself. Um, so let, let's think about water. So water molecule, what happens is you have uh, hydrogen atoms fall in love with an oxygen atom, decide to embrace it, and then what happens? Gas turns into something completely different, water, a liquid. So out of two gases, something really new emerges. And water itself, uh, is something that always wants to bind with other things, to touch, to flow. It wants to, to be without water, there is no life. Water is a kind of polyamorous miracle. And for, for Weber, we need to see love as a biological principle. For him, being alive is an erotic process of constantly transforming yourself, the self, through contact with the others. You cannot be alive, you cannot transform yourself without that contact with the others. And life is a process of always desiring to be more alive, to flourish more. He writes, 
Erotic ecology is an art of living, of caring for the biosphere, and of creating satisfying relationships inspired by the eros of life, the power which makes everything in our reality yearn for connection and transformation. So, if the future of ecology is going to be erotic, then as far as we're concerned, it needs to be as queer as fuck. And as our fabulous ancestor Audrey Lord reminds us, the erotic is not a question only of what we do, it's a question of how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing. And we'll get back to feeling later. So at the beginning, we showed this video that we pr uh, produced for a Beltane ritual uh, where we live. Uh, and you saw these slugs uh, uh, mating. We used to hate slugs because they ate all the lettuces in the garden. But when we were making this video, we discovered this video of leopard slugs mating. I mean, leopard slugs are not some, you know, you get leopard slugs in your gardens in, 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 in Flanders. Um, and we saw these slugs mating and this incredible kind of psychedelic mating ritual where they, they have, you know, these, they all, they have penises that come out of the left side of their, of their head and they're like 60 centimeters long and then they become these huge blue blooms, absolutely extraordinary. You can never hate snails after you've seen leopard snails, uh, I mean uh, slugs after you've seen them, them, them mate. Um, and uh, they, uh, they, they are hermaphrodite, basically means when you're hermaphrodite, you can make, if you're a snail or a slug, you can make love with yourself. Uh, you can make love with someone else, um, if you want, uh, and, you can, and you're reproducing in both acts. Uh, you can choose whether to mate as a male or female. Um, and most slugs decide that actually, when they're mating, they're going to be male and female at the same time. Um, now, who here has seen Finding Nemo? Yeah, right. What Disney didn't tell you is that clownfish are also hermaphrodite. And in fact, male clownfish, the, the daddy in, in Nemo, could have transformed themselves into a female clownfish to protect the territory and their kids. And why would they, the males transform themselves into a female? Because the female cl clown shif, clownfish are much bigger and much more aggressive than the males, and sometimes even attack massive sharks. Disney forgot all that. Slime molds are also hermaphrodite. I mean, how queer can you get, really? Um, I mean, uh, they have 720 different sexes. That's super hermaphrodite. Um, and they continue to really confuse scientists uh, because they completely blur all the boundaries. They blur the boundary between what is collective and what is individual. They, they go around as individual cells, they're single-celled organisms, and then if they get hungry, they suddenly get together and work as a gang, and then they go back to being individuals. Um, they, uh, they, they can move, they, they, they feel like mushrooms, but actually they behave like animals. Um, they can recognize each other, they learn, they anticipate, they make decisions. And so we've got all these unimaginable non-binary lives. And we're told that to be queer is not natural. And there we have it, the ultimate argument. The ultimate argument that rests on the ultimate toxic binary, which is nature versus culture. The great toxic father binary of so many others, nature versus culture, body versus mind, female versus male, savage versus civilized, thinking versus feeling, art versus life. So we would like to do a little anti, the ritual was to do an anti-dedication to this talk, to one of the ancestors who laid the foundations of toxic dualism, the great father of dualism in the Western world. Anyone guess who this is? It's not St. Valentine, is it? Descartes, ah, oh, well done. God, can you recognize everyone who's dead? 
Um, so this is Descartes, and we s saw his skull in a, we went to vis visit his skull in a, in a museum in Paris. And, um, you know, as, as, as he wrote, uh, to make ourselves, as it were, the masters and possessors of nature, he wrote. And famously, he wrote the famous thing, I think, therefore I am, which became the very template for the body-mind binaries. But actually, this phrase was followed by a phrase which is much less known, which is, a being needs no place to exist. A being needs no place to exist. It's the ultimate fantasy of detachment. It's the ultimate fantasy of a world where it's dangerous to be attached. It's the total opposite of erotic ecology. And so, René, your dream was to fool humans, well, at least the kind of white male European elites at the time, into imagining themselves independent from the rest of life so that you could understand it, dissect it, and ultimately control the world. René, we would like to anti-dedicate this talk to you, and we'd like to dedicate it to the death of your ideas uh, and to a non-binary ecological future. And because all life is bodies, we're going to start uh, with bodies, bodies of cells within bodies of beings. And, um, and we would like to start with your bodies for a bit. So I would like to um, invite those of you who identify as women and who have ever, even just once, worn trousers to please stand up. Thank you. Can you stay standing up? And of those who are still seated, if you've ever gone on strike, could you please stand up? And, and stay standing up. And of those who are still seated, if you've ever worked and taken a weekend off, could you please stand up? And if those who are still seated, if there are some, if you've ever had um, access to contraception or even information about contraception, like the pill, condom, coitus interruptus doesn't count. Um, I think that everybody is standing up. I could carry on if you've ever had access to independent media, if you um, have not worked as a child, if you have cycled as a child. Um, and all of us standing up have one thing in common that can uh, be summed up in one word. What, do you, what would you suggest that word is? Anarchism. Not quite. It could, but there is, there is one that we feel is, is more pointed and more interesting. Pardon? Yeah, life, it's true, but there is another one that might be more privilege. Yeah, getting there. Rights, we're getting close. Freedom, yeah, what got us there? Struggle, yes, almost. Actually, the word that we feel is really um, the most interesting is disobedience, because actually all these rights uh, even the simplest one as wearing trousers when you identify as a woman, uh, actually were not given by benevolent authorities because we asked them nicely. They were actually hard won through struggle and disobedience. And at a point where most of these rights are threatened and put in jeopardy, and most of life on earth is put in jeopardy, we thought it was an interesting moment to bear that in mind. Thank you very much. You can sit down again. And um, as Oscar Wilde said, disobedience in the eye of anyone who has read history is our original virtue. It is through disobedience and rebellion that progress has been made. Um, 
disobedience has actually been central to um, all our work um, because we feel that this is really the way the future is molded uh, for the better. And uh, so in 2004, we set up the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination uh, together. And, um, and when the, poli the Metropolitan Police in London called us a not normal traveling theater company, we were actually really proud because we never quite liked normal. Um, what we like actually are edges. In ecosystems, uh, it really is at the edges that evolution is amplified. At the edge between land and water or prairies and forests, um, that's really the place where life blossoms the most, where the, um, the, they are the ultimate places of creativity because they are where there is the maximum diversity of relationships between species not necessarily so many species, but many uh, relationships of all these different beings that are connecting and touching, as Jay was talking about. After all, um, let's not forget that it is at the edge of ocean and land that life began. And there is one edge uh, that we've been exploring for uh, many years, maybe the primary edge, um, and that is the one between art and activism. So for nearly <laughs> 20 years uh, now, we've been, as um, Olaf was uh, saying, bringing artists and activists together to really design and deploy, not just conceptualize, actually, and deploy them, new tools of resistance and disobedience, and often in the form of workshops and and during those workshops, there is another edge that we very much encourage to, uh, um, to explore, and that is the, the learning zone that is, as Olaf was beautifully describing, that zone of discomfort that is between, between comfort and panic. Like when you are exploring that edge, this is where you this is where you learn, and um, because all edges it's dynamic and it needs to be stretched like a body. And out of all these uh, workshops we've been carrying on, carrying out, sorry, uh, there are tools and methodologies uh, that have emerged. So it could take the form of a methodology like the clown army that was merging the ancient art of clowning with direct action, um, taking actions such as um, actually trying to be recruited by the real um, British army and causing such chaos in the recruitment agency that they would have to close it so we would open a really crappy uh, recruitment office outside theirs. Um, or at one point when we recruited 200 clowns for a G8 uh, protest, this clown covered riot shields in pink lipstick kisses and made them magically um, back off the cops. Um, one of the reasons clowns are so powerful is because they are the ultimate non-binary beings. Uh, they're tricksters, they're shapeshifters, they're agents of mutations. Because in the end, are clowns wise or stupid or both? Are they scary or funny or both? Are they male or female or both? This is actually Jay being arrested. Um, at the time, the police file, when they arrested them, said that they were a 28-year-old female. They were 40 at the time. <laughs> that made them very happy. We kept the thing in our living room for a long time. Um, and the clown army was a methodology of, of resistance that spread away and that spread across many countries from Bolivia to New Zealand in the, in the year 2000s. And even though we were its parents, we were also the first deserters, because that's a long story that we can tell you more about later. Um, in our work, our work can take the form of objects, like these um, plaques that were produced uh, by a youth group for park benches in, in London. 
Um, and there is another edge that uh, for us is really important, and that is the one between social movements and institutions. We've always entangled ourselves in radical movements, working as organizers within them and as art activists. Um, for many years, it's been climate justice movements, such as the climate camps in the, in the UK. And so, for instance, for the, the climate camp that was uh, set up against the building of the third runway for, the, for Heathrow Airport, we produced these shields that were reinforced with two second tents um, at, the, at the back. And each one um, was a, a portrait of someone affected by a climate breakdown. So these shields would actually be used to push through uh, police lines and to go on to um, occupy the HQ of the climate criminal corporation that wanted to, uh, to build uh, the, the runway, um, throwing the, the pop-up tents, and like throwing ourselves um, into it. Um, which, as an asterisk, the third runway is not is not yet built, and in my view, it never will be. So you know, resistance is fertile, um, and some of these objects sometimes uh, end up in museums, like the shields ended up in the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum in in London, but that is never the point at all for us. Um, and that particular show was called Disobedient Objects and was really amazing. And we also had one of our disobedient bikes exhibited there. But for us, in a time of historical crisis, public cultural institutions should be places of production rather than um, exhibition. And we mean material production of resistance movements. That's what these places should be for. Um, and so, for instance, uh, in 2009, to resist the corporate takeover of the COP, the uh, UN uh, Climate Summit in Copenhagen, we did an experiment. We prefer talking about experiments rather than work or projects, or certainly not pieces, because actually we want to give ourselves the right to fail, even though we don't like it. And, um, and that experiment was called Put the Fun Between Your Legs, Become a Bike Block. Whenever there is a, uh, a COP, uh, a UN climate summit that comes to a city, all the cultural institutions become really interested in, in climate. They become really passionate about it. It doesn't last very long, usually the year that the COP is there. Um, but all of a sudden, you can be sure that all the shows have climate and climate catastrophe as their themes. And during the Paris summit, um, Olaf Eliasson and Minik Rosing um, actually had uh, Arctic ice heliported to a Paris square um, for the public to watch it melt. It was a work to raise awareness about the climate breakdown. That's in the lab what we called um, extractivist art. But we'll, come that, we'll come to that later. Ice Watch was the name of that piece, and what we feel it reveals is actually another binary that we need to try to dissolve, and that we always try to dissolve, and that is the one uh, that uh, is actor versus spectator, like those who do and those who watch. Um, and so if you put the fun between your legs, uh, it was, uh, it was commissioned by a gallery um, in Bristol called the Anofini and the, muse the Copenhagen Museum of Contemporary Art. The idea was simple, uh, to bring artists, activists and bike lovers together to transform the hundreds of um, bicycles that are abandoned on the streets of Copenhagen for a reason still unknown to us there are hundreds of bicycles abandoned in the streets of Copenhagen, and turn them into tools of disobedience. So we would build them uh, in the galleries and then take them out into the streets. There was a problem, uh, because obviously the galleries were white cubes, so you can't weld in white cubes. Um, so we ordered shipping containers for the welding that were put outside of the 
of the gallery, so it was all going well. And then um, I was working full time at the time, uh, and Jay received a, a phone call from the curator in Copenhagen, um, and explained that in Denmark there are rules and regulations as to what constitutes a bicycle. It needs to have a certain length, height, number of wheels, etc., um, and uh, and so that our designs should be sent to the police that would have three weeks to validate them, and uh, we could move on from there. So Jay said, well, that's all great, but it's, it's a disobedience project, so who cares about whether the bikes are legal or not? And then she had that memorable uh, answer, oh, you're really going to do it. And here the relationship between movements and institutions becomes complicated. Because especially when that um, institution believes still that art is pretended, pretending to do politics. It's a long story, but as you might expect, the, um, the museum in Copenhagen pulled out. And so we ended up working from an incredible squad. Uh, with 200 people coming together to um, design and build uh, day and, and night, hundreds of machines of disobedience, including the DDT, the Double Double Trouble, um, and, uh, and learning from the ways uh, birds and bees move as swarm. And so we train together to be able to swarm through the streets uh, during during the COP, and despite the double double trouble being uh, confiscated by uh, the police during a very theatrical raid, where they claim to have found the wall bikes, the wall bike looks like looks like that. Um, we still managed to reach our objective, which was 150 people in 13 different bike blocks became lures uh, for the police, taking them away from the people's assembly. That is an assembly that was made up of frontline climate uh, defenders and that was called by movements from the most impacted in the global south and indigenous communities to leave the official um, assembly. Um, and despite the fact that they were called by the most impacted, um, actually uh, the police still attacked that uh, popular assembly and the bikes managed to hold many of the police um, away and, um, and many of these bicycles ended up as being very efficient barricades to, uh, to disrupt the police violence. So yes, we actually do really do it. It's, and it's really important uh, for us. And this phrase remains for us, the one that uncovers so much truth around the world of contemporary art because it reveals the fact that there is another toxic binary that needs to be dissolved and that is the one between ideas and action. The binary between what you think and what you do in your life, what you believe in and how you behave. Because you can talk about radical politics uh, forever in the art world or as a matter of fact in the academy um, but when you shift from idea to action and from radical mind to disobedient body, then very often censorship occurs. Um, but tonight we've been asked to talk about uh, the future and not the past, so we won't recount um, all the old stories of um, joyful resistance that um, we've had over the many years we've been doing it um, and some of the other adventures uh, that we've had when uh, cultural institutions do not understand the meaning of the word disobedience, but we can talk about that um, later. We see why theater makers love the intense drama of assemblies and why they want to bring it into the dark box of the theater. Yet for us, this is what vampires do, not what artists should be doing at this moment of history. Sucking the form out of political movements to feed a cultural career is what so many so-called political artists are doing despite the crisis of these times. So much creativity is put into building empty mirrors of this dying world rather than constructing ways to resist and build other worlds. We're living in a time where it is easier to imagine the collapse of life as we know it 
than reinventing the right ways to live together. No artist or activist has ever had to work in such a moment in history, and yet our culture continues to turn its back on life. Business as usual is the order of the day, especially in the museums and theatres of the metropolis. Perhaps the best term is not vampire, though, because vampires don't have a choice. Artists do. Perhaps we could call these practices extractivist art. Extractivism takes nature, stuff, material from somewhere and transforms it into something that gives value somewhere else. That value is always more important than the continuation of life of the communities from which wealth is extracted. Artists' careers are built out of sucking value out of disaster, rebellion, animism, magic, movements, whatever is a fashionable topic at the time, and regurgitate it into an unsituated, detached experience elsewhere, anywhere in fact, as long as the codes of the world of art function. But whom do such pieces serve, ultimately? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN climate scientists, not known for their revolutionary spirit, wrote in 2018 that if we want to avoid the worst of the catastrophe, we had 12 years left for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. We must revolutionize so much of our existence and fast. This must include art. Why make an installation about refugees being stuck at the border when you could co-design tools to cut through fences? Why a performance about the dictatorship of finance when you could be inventing new ways of moneyless exchange? Why make a dance piece about food riots when your skills could craft crowd choreographies to disrupt fascist rallies? Why bring an assembly on stage as a spectacle rather than design joyful ways of making decisions together to be used for social movements to be more resilient. Be careful with the present that you create, because it should look like the future that you dream. This is what the anarcho-feminist art collective Mujeres Creando wrote um, on the wall in Bolivia. I think that I probably would add uh, that it should feel also the few the, like the future that you dream. And all the movements that we've been in involved in believe in this. It's not just a poetic uh, uh, take. It's actually a very deep strategic principle that you don't wait for the end of capitalism, the end of white supremacy, of patriarchy, the collapse of dualism. Um, you actually try to live as if you were already free now, in the present. And as Angela Davis um, put it so beautifully, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. That's one what could called a living revolution, living revolutionary lives today to sculpt a just tomorrow. But can we still make art? So, if we're working towards some non-binary ecological future and we want to prefigure the future now, can we still make art? Well, in our last book, We Are Nature, with a uh, defending itself, uh, there's a chapter which is entitled 200 Years of Art and the World is Getting Worse. It's, it's a nod to a beautiful book by um, James Hillman that's called 200 Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. Um, and uh, in it, we develop an idea by an art historian called Larry Schinner, who says that art is an invention. Uh, art as we know it now, the way we think about an art now in the, West, in the Western world and, uh, is, is an invention. And it's an invention that occurs around 1750, and it's an invention of the bourgeois, white, European, colonial metropolis. Now, funny enough, this invention happens exactly at the same time as another invention, which is the, what's called the Industrial Revolution. 
the invention of machines to burn the fossil fuels that are burning our life today. And for most of human history, as most of you I'm sure know, in most of the world's cultures, even now, there is no word, no single word to describe what most of us in these kind of spaces call art. In fact, most of the world has never had a word to define this activity as something separate from everyday life. Even concert halls, like this, are an invention. For the 18th century, there was no idea that you could have concert halls or museums. I mean, the idea to watch people play music, separated from a situation, detached from a specific place and an event, with a, with no, with, without a purpose, it was unimaginable. I mean, music was to have wild parties with, to dance, to do carnival, maybe to do mass, but it was never something you listened to, just listened to, and sat down separately from. Same with paintings. Paintings had specific places in specific chairs, ch places, churches, and they had specific purposes. Often each painting would be, have some healing practice around some kind of uh, 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 saint or whatever. Um, and now, mostly, they're ripped from place, and they're ripped from purpose, and they're put in museums to contemplate. Even the fucking Greeks didn't have a word for art. Um, in fact, it's a, ma it's a mixture of the Latin achs and the Greek techne, which meant any human activity. It could mean horse breaking, shoemaking, verse writing, vase painting, even governing could be an art. Not because it was done by artists. The key to it was that it was, and this was the most important thing, it was done with grace. Grace. Grace is an act of thinking with and thanking the world. It's a word that comes from the French, mean, grâce meaning thank you, as in grâce à, as in gratitude. To thank life for giving us life. Mutual reciprocity. It's the core value of the process of an art of life. But around 1750, what you have is these great, more great separations, 100 years after, well, a few generations after Descartes. And uh, all the things that used to be considered part of a, a traditional concept of art began to be split apart. So genius was split apart from skill, the beautiful was split from the useful, artists were split from craftspeople. And without these violent separations, all the cultural institutions that some of us us included work in, would not be able to exist. And this uh, invention of art, of course, was promoted by missionaries, by armies, entrepreneurs, art dealers, intellectuals. And this new invention was another engine of progress and a sign that all the hierarchies being imposed were completely natural. Uh, a civilization that could produce was presented as great works of art was destined and entitled to rule. The ideas and ideals of art sadly continue to colonize our imaginations everywhere. And as Ayala Aisha Azule writes, from the beginning art has been one of imperialism's preferred terrain. Imperial violence is not secondary to art but constitutive, constitutive of it. To colonize a place, you have to destroy its worlds. And so colonizers outlawed indigenous people's ceremonies so as to steal their lands and their ritual objects. And Azule writes, violently separating people from the objects they hold in common and objects from the communities that create them and give them different types of meaning is what we now call art. So this invention of art is seen as the thing that defines humanity. But for 50 million years, long time before humans even began to paint rocks, the bowerbirds had, had been grinding pigment from fruit and seeds and painting and decorating their colorful uh, mating bowers so that they can dance in them. Uh, 
And now they've evolved to love plastic and use plastic to decorate their bowers. This is a real bowerbird. Um, humpback whales, they rehearse their songs for hours and hours on, on end, and they collect and uh, uh, they, they cast a web of communication across the globe. So perhaps meaning, perhaps feeling, expression, creativity, communication, perhaps they're not unique to humans. Perhaps they're the epicenter of what defines life. Now, how we define life itself is perhaps is going to decide our future. And we're a really interesting moment. The classic models of biology, which are under 200 years old, which are the models that created the framework that enabled life to be turned into a resource, enabled life to be othered, enabled life to be extracted, are changing. Uh, this blindness towards what is life is now being shaken to its core. It's a revolution which is like quantum physics was changed Newto Newtonian physics and relativity. So now, biology, with its ability to sequence genes, to look deep into the microscopic world, to, to correlate huge data sets and study the entire genome of a being, Biology is showing us that actually a lot of what traditional and indigenous, indigenous knowledge knew all along, that life is not actually a machine. It's not a machine made up of discrete building blocks, but it's a dynamic, interpenetrating, interrelating whole. And all life is made from breath and bodies whether it's a cell of a w is whether it's a cell from the cell to the whale where all these fleshy bodies entangled and nested into other bodies and we might all have very different bodies i mean my body is not the same as a worm's body although i would really wouldn't mind having a worm's body because their entire body is a taste organ so everything you touch you taste yeah what's your what do those seats taste like um but all our bodies are different. Uh, and from at every scale, from the cells in our fingers to the body of an oak tree, there's something that all bodies share, according to biology now, and that is feeling, sensing, the capacity to sense and feel the world. So for, for quite a while now, scientists have been finding em empirical evidence that all living things share this. And what they do is they translate feeling into form, into matter, into bodies. Experiments show that you can plant seeds uh, in the same in in environment, uh, identical seeds, identical settings, each one is actually different. Each one is a self and it's committed to its ongoing existence in a particular body, embedded in and interpreting a particular place. So as the roots emerge from the seeds, there's nothing deterministic going on. They're not following the dictatorship of DNA. It's much more like uh, a, a, a composer writes a, a partition and a musician decides how to write that partition. But it's so much more about the connections that they make around themselves and when roots grow they choose where they go they choose to main where the plant is able to maintain and flourish itself so they go towards water friendly bacteria friendly fungi minerals and they go to touch those things and they turn away from what is toxic it's not about consciousness it's not saying that cells are conscious necessary we could say they're intelligent, intelligere, comes from the Latin, it means to choose, to discern between things, to choose an existence, to experience a concern for a core self and express it is the very definition of life. So if we can imagine an oak tree, so the most accurate scientific way of looking at an oak tree is you're gonna measure it, you're gonna observe and measure and measure and measure. Um, but Maybe the most interesting way now 
with new biology is looking at what does it mean to be an oak tree, to be this tree, to imagine it as a living sculpture, to imagine it as something that ex is expressing its experience of self. So the tree has an inwardness, a desire to live, to become herself, and she has the felt experience of hundreds and hundreds of years which translate into her material body, her shape, her shape for reaching to the sun, her shape for going into the earth to reach for the water below. And you can see this particularly in when, when you see uh, um, uh, barbed wire going through a bark, you can see how the bark grows around the, the wired fence. And that scar of tree flesh is a witness to its past and to its becoming future. It's the body that mirrors experience. And all life are bodies that mirror experience. Weber writes, if feeling is a physical force, and the expression of this feeling is a physical reality, whose meaning motivates organisms to act, then we might understand living beings better if we imagine what is happening in the bi biosphere as in a way resembling artistic expression. Art then is no longer what separates humans from nature, but rather it is life's voice fully in us. And so if all living beings are expressive, meaning-making selves, every flower, every insect, every cell, an artist in their own right, where does that leave us artists? This is still me. So uh, the Western um, artistic avant-garde of the last century, from Dada to Situationism, they had this holy trinity, which was art, activism, and everyday life. And we felt we were doing okay with the art activism binary, but there was a problem, everyday life. We were living here, London. Uh, we'd do our actions, we'd go to the summits, the climate camps, and then we'd always return home, back to wage labor, back to the mortgage, back to life as a couple in this metropolis reproducing capitalism in our everyday life while away we were trying to fight and change it and live otherwise. And the metropolis is a milieu in which everything is done so that humans only relate to themselves. It's only humans that make history. It's only humans who have intelligence. In a way, the metropolis is the reign of the artificial over everything. And something felt deeply wrong every time we came home. And so we decided to go on a journey. We went on a journey for seven months. Uh, we left our job for the, for we took a sabbatical from our jobs, and we visited communities where people were living uh, despite capitalism, in com communal ways, uh, in self-management. We went to squatted farms, a liberated love community, um, occupied factories run by their workers, an anarchist school, and out of it came a book and a film called Les Sentiers de l'Utopie, or Paths Through Utopias. And the book was a kind of travel essay uh, describing our experience of the journey and the history of the places. And the film which came with the book uh, was a fictional documentary. Uh, filmed during the journey, it was a kind of road movie after an economic, ecological and economic collapse of Europe. And this was the how people were now living. This was the normal way people were now living, self-organized and in common. And all the places we met, met and the people we met, those that tra went through us in those seven months, changed us really radically. And we decided to leave London and desert our jobs. And we ended up in Western France, setting up a collective school, uh, sorry, a collective farm and a school for art and activism in an old ruined farm. Um, but there was still a problem. We realized that the metropolis was still in our body minds and in our behaviors. And even though we'd boycotted flying because we were climate justice activists, we hadn't flown for 17 years at the time, we still felt part of that hypermobile metropolitan cultural class. 
spending time going from one festival to another, one conference to another, and always passing through these non-places, the same cultural centers, the same airports, the same hotels, and the same Airbnbs, the same cafes, the same galleries, all uprooted from any material place, ripped from any local community, distanced from contexts where actually they might have more agency to transform this material world. And it suits the, 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 the elite uh, and the status quo very well that all the radical thinkers and makers don't have a territory, that they belong no nowhere, that they float in some abstract, vapid world where no solution is graspable, where radical thinking has no anchor in action. Now, if you're an artist and your CV says, I've had shows in Kinshasa, in, Bur uh, in Dubai, New York, Istanbul, Buenos Aires, and I live between Berlin and Copenhagen, then fantastic, you've got a great career. If you say, I've spent all my life living in my local village and studying the deep relationships that people have with the river in my local village, your art career is fucked. <laughs> and so how do we become the territory? This is the question. Um, we were taught a lesson by the living world, what the dualists used to call nature, um, a lesson on how to become territory. So we were living this farm, we kept getting invitations, going on the train, going to do these festivals and stuff, we invited to Camp Nagel Festival, to the summer festival, to do a project. Big budget, super exciting. Uh, we did a 10-day course in, that we ran on permaculture, art, and activism for preca precarious youth. And at the end of the course, there was a show that the, the, the folk on the course had partly designed. And as often when we go do stuff in the theatres, one of the first things we want to do is break the binary that is actor-spectator, actor-spectator. So we invite the audience onto, onto the stage, and the stage becomes an assembly. And in this case, it was an assembly to discuss, was it ethical or not? to uh, leave the theater armed with ants, raspberry ants, that actually sabotage computers. I can tell them about that later, but they're real ants, they exist, and they sabotage computers. And so the discussion on the assembly was, is it ethical to leave the stage, go and do this, and sabotage the computers of banks that are funding fossil fuels? And the audience said, yeah, it's perfectly ethical. So. Um, uh, the, we left the, the stage with these edible costumes and we went into the city and put the pheromones of these ants in the banks. <laughs> but we love mushrooms, not just magic mushrooms. We think all mushrooms are magic. Um, and we love them uh, because they're the recyclers of death into life. And we had a dream that we wanted to turn the huge, it was nine by 10 meters curtain of the theater into a mushroom kind of skin, uh, and that the audience would eat the mushrooms, they weren't magic mushrooms, eat them before going to put the pheromones. And we worked with an artist, Catherine Ball, put loads of work, 10 days in making this curtain, 10 by nine meters, and if anyone's done mushroom, uh, not done mushrooms, grown mushrooms, um, you know that you water them, you don't see anything, you water them for 10 days, you don't see anything, and then they go boop, and then they, it was called pinning, and then three days later they go boom. Uh, well, they went boop, uh, but then there was a heat wave. And the mushroom said, forget your, you know, your cultural timetable. We've got our natural timetable. We're not coming out. It's way too hot out there. So we had a moldy curtain. And the whole project was a bit of a disaster. Socially, everything was a bit of a disaster, the whole project. And we got home. And at the time, it was the farmhouse was a ruin. And we were living in this tent. And we got home tired. Disappointed, why had we gone all across Europe to go and do this? And we opened the tent door and there were mushrooms all over the roof of the tent. And it was a lesson. It was a lesson from the fungi. Remember to ter territorialize yourself. Remember to entangle yourself into a place. Remember to desert the metropolitan thinking. And, and so we left that collective and ended up um, here in this squatted farmhouse, which is now our collective home on the ZAD of Notre-Dame-des-Landes. Um, 
which is, you know, on these 14, four, sorry, 4,000 acres that were earmarked to build a new airport for the city of Nantes. Um, it was another extractivist dream to suck up uh, these wetlands dry, to cover these food producing farmlands with their anonymous cows, um, in concrete to build another machine of hypermobility. Uh, we haven't got the time to talk about the details of the incredibly creative uh, resistance against the airport that lasted more than 40 years. Uh, you can read about it in the book, um, but we can give you a brief overview. Uh, initially, the infrastructure was resisted uh, by local farmers um, for like, since the 70s. Um, and then in 2009, uh, during France's first climate camp, um, it took place there on the site of the, of the projected um, airport. And during the camp, uh, a letter was, um, was read that had been written by inhabitants of the land that invited people to come and squat the empty uh, farmhouses and the threatened uh, land, empty uh, farmhouses, because they had been bought by the government to be able to build the airport. And famously, they said, to defend a territory, you need to inhabit it. Um, and after the camp folded, it stands uh, a handful of people decided to stay. And this is when the slogan against the airport and its world really came into being. Um, it's also when the ZAD, the zone to defend, uh, was born. The zone to defend is actually a hack on an ad administrative uh, term. That means zone à aménagement différé, a zone earmarked for further development, for deferred development. And it was the beginning of what would become kind of world famous autonomous zones. At its peak, there were uh, 70 collectives and more than 350 people uh, living despite capitalism on these 4,000 acres without bosses or leaders, self-managing their life together and saying no to the airport, but yes to other forms of life. Um, and the ZAD became a territory where people really tried to um, take back uh, everyday life into their own hands and break the deep separations that we've been talking about. For whole six years, we lived without the police. The sign here says, you are entering a free territory. Here, the people decide. And the people in that case are not just the human people, but the all the more um, than human people that we share it with. For us, art is simply paying attention to something, whether it's making a meal or making love, cutting someone's hair or organizing an action. And when you take back um, control of your everyday life, when you have to decide for everything together, it requires a certain attention. And as Foucault, Michel Foucault, philosopher, activist, wrote, we need a technique of life. We have to create ourselves as work of art, rather than something which is specialized or which is done by experts. Why couldn't everyone's life become a work of art, he asked. And it is really on the ZAD that we finally uh, found that we were part of an art of life with its huge banquets or its pirate radios that was squatting uh, the Vinci, the big multinational that would build the airport um, airwaves, uh, with its bakeries, with its hand-built um, homes in the forests or floating on lakes, with its collective harvests. It is really on this land that we have felt that the separations um, begin to dissolve. So the separation between what is your home and what is a bird's nest started to melt in our, in our eyes. The separation between your house and the exp expression of your rage. The separation between what is a home and what is a barricade melts. The separation between what is work and pleasure melts. The separation between what is life and what is activism with radical camembert, of course, made by squatting cows. The separation between what is useful and what is beautiful, uh, and taking the form of building a lighthouse where they wanted, uh, exactly on the side where they wanted to put the control tower of the airport. 
and, um, and perhaps maybe uh, the most powerful, dissolving the separation between resisting this world and building new ones. But of course, no governments um, like this, um, especially when you can demonstrate that you actually can live without them, but the we don't like it. Um, and so they tried to first um, evict uh, us to build the airport, and the resistance uh, was as diverse as the ecosystems that we were trying to stop being destroyed. The mud was our accomplice. And despite the government destroying many farmhouses and collectives, we rebuilt on the ruins every time, sometimes with 40,000 people joining. Uh, it always felt like the best kind of theater, like when 300 people move this kind of combat structure to replace the destroyed collective um, assembly hall that had been destroyed. Uh, the best kind of ritual, where uh, when, for instance, when 25,000 people came to um, place sticks on into the ground and made the pledge to return to get them if the government came to build the airport. They never did. Um, and in January 2018, the airport was cancelled. And this is the beautiful thing for us. It is that there will never be an airport on this wetlands. And this is the art of life, because we have become the territory. We know its winding path. We have become its woodlands and wetlands. We know where the owls give birth and when the salanders mate. The relationships and the attachments that we have built between ourselves and the more than human forms of life on the zone will never be taken away. And of course, of course, like all life, it is imperfect, it is messy, it is conflictual, it's fucked up on many grounds, and it doesn't make it less precious. And now, so to nowadays, we co-design rituals um, that are there to mark the wheel of the year, rituals that are by their nature reciprocal, thanking the land and all that inhabit it, and remind us that the more you inhabit a territory, the more it inhabits you. And the most important thing for us is that the wetlands remain wetlands, that the farmlands remain fruit producing land, and that the airport will ever, ever be just a negative shape, a ghost. And that is for us the role of the art of life, holding back the monoculture machine, decolonizing a place from capital, opening it up, as somewhere that enables forms of life to flourish, to connect, to unfold. That is what is beautiful. The art of aliveness is to let life live more. And, and we'll end with this beautiful quote by Alan Capro that says, we may see the overall meaning of art change profoundly from being an end to being a means, from holding out a promise of perfection in some other realm to demonstrating a way of living meaningfully in this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 15 minutes is a long time to talk, huh? And to stand. Take a break. It's good. Take a break. <laughs> I'm going to talk to these lovely people here for a few minutes while you, uh, while you take a break. I think we all kind of need a break after this. Am I, am I the only one who's like went through a whole journey tonight? Like there's so much... Uh, that I want to, and mind you, I've read this book uh, already about five times already, I think. Uh, not necessarily just for preparing for this, but because I kept on thinking, oh, how did they say that again in conversations with other people? I'd be like, wait, how did they say that again? And then I would go look at it, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, even though I know a lot of your thinking and your work mostly in the Zant, I am entirely blown away already again tonight. Um, so I don't even know, like in a few minutes, where to start with them. But anyways, I can imagine you have a lot of things that you've felt and a lot of things that you have thought. Uh, 
I'm going to get us started by having a few questions uh, for uh, these lovely peoples. And then I'm hoping to get you to be part of that conversation, right? And I know, I know, like, it's difficult for Belgians <laughs> to participate. And I know this hall, this concert hall does not help. It's very intimidating, right? And we're on the podium and stuff. And I know it's really intimidating. I'm sorry for that. But I'm going to ask you to be extra courageous with us tonight because... Uh, I think part of that hospitality we were talking about, some of that care that we're talking about is, I mean, I do lectures and I do, I speak at places and you come and you sit here and you're told that you're an expert of some sort and then you're telling your thoughts and you're sitting across people whom, if you can see them, which we cannot really well, very well here right now, uh, if you can't see them, there's something that happens on people's faces when they're paying very close attention. They become entirely blank. <laughs> it's really scary. Like are you, so you're talking to people. You're sharing your thoughts, your feelings, things you've learned, things you've, and what you're getting back is just. <laughs> and uh, I experience that as a kind of a, a certain form of violence sometimes, because you, and it's a bit of that extractivist thing, right? You're just giving and giving, and you're getting nothing back. Um, I always find it extremely. Uh, nice and helpful and satisfying and reciprocal when people start kind of telling me what they were feeling when they were doing all this intense thinking and feeling. They give some of their ideas and thoughts and so on back to me so that I don't leave with just having given but gotten some back, right? And I know that you're supposed to ask questions, which then makes it really difficult, especially if you're shy, because then you're like, oh, I don't have a question, but you know. How about for tonight we don't necessarily do questions? Okay, what if you felt something, something resonated, or you thought something, or you wondered about something? You don't have to ask it as a question, you can just share it. Is that okay? Yeah. Would you be okay with that? That whatever you kind of like experience, that you give us a little bit of that. Right? It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be like a full, like, well-phrased, eloquent paragraph. You can just begin talking and see where you end up. <laughs> and I think this is a secret that a lot of shy people don't know about, like, speaking in public. They look at people like me and they think that before we speak, we know exactly what we're going to say. <laughs> but that's just not true. I barely ever know really well, unless, I, unless I've written it down. <laughs> but like this, I don't know, I just get started. And um, allow yourself to hear your own thoughts. And I find it a really, I find a really good pr practice and exercise to start talking and then and just listening to yourself as you go along. Uh, because you discover some of the things that you've been thinking and feeling while you're trying to kind of figure out how to say it perfectly. Like, you no, know, just speak and it will come. Yeah? Be brave, I know it's hard, be courageous, and please let's reciprocate for the amazing, beautiful presentation you've just given us. Mind you, if you want to resonate and vibe and comment and share, and it's not a question, or even if, it, even if it is a question, we don't have to respond, right? We can just hear you. Or we can be inspired and have something to say or disagree or whatever. Also, you don't have to just speak when you agree with us. Huh? <laughs> we can also vehemently disagree and you can talk about that. Um, but we don't, nobody is obligated to respond. Nobody is obligated, nobody's owed an answer of any kind, right? Okay. Be brave, I believe in you. <laughs> oh, somebody, oh yeah. By the way, there is a microphone. And Helena has the microphone. Can we perhaps, is this big light necessary or is? Hello? Yeah. Michael, kunnen we misschien dit licht een beetje minder doen? En een beetje de zaal licht wat, wat meer, zodat we mensen kunnen zien in de zaal? Ah, nice. Thank you, Michael. Hello. 
Is this the part where we can participate? <laughs> <laughs> Any part, you couldn't so participate. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I uh, was feeling many different things that I'm not yet able to um, process, and um, but I really want to say thank you. Um, and also, the main feeling I had was, wow, I feel so engaged to um, be disobedient also, <laughs> which is a good thing, but also the turnover to connection, I thought it was really beautiful and I was constantly like, yeah, this is amazing that it is also connection and the, the disobedience and the connection are there together. And uh, so, yes, I just wanted to share that this was the main feeling and thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yep. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I like that. But See? later uh, we'll talk more. But <laughs> Perfect. Perfection. Just get started. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, somebody else. Okay, this is great. <laughs> this has never happened before. I usually, <laughs> usually I give this whole speech and then y'all are quiet for, two, for one hour straight. <laughs> so this is brilliant. <laughs> Over here. This is the family part. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I also would like to thank you. Um, I'm not Belgian, so <laughs> I like speaking my mind. I'm also scared when I have to, but uh, I feel like uh, when you're out there, uh, the words uh, keep coming out. Well, while I was listening, um, I felt that I heard a lot of things that resonate with the things that I feel and hope and want to uh, get out there and do with other people. Um, and whenever I feel like this, I'm like, um, yeah, this, this place is full of helplessness. Like people have these amazing ideas, they have so much motivation and initiative and yeah the metropole just gets you down as you said it like you feel like you're always it's just like a drop in the ocean that you do something but when you see like this this kind of projects that connect people truly um, it's really for me hopeful to to receive opportunities to connect like this and talk about this you never know where it will get you might meet somebody and do the next collective. Mm. And I feel that's the power of people getting together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. you. Sharing. Yeah, and I think one thing that we maybe don't say in the presentation, but one thing that we've been very inspired by learning through um, history of social movements is that there is that sense that to be able to have great changes, you need everyone to be on board. And as long as we're not going to have everyone, then we're not going to be able to change. And it's not true. Is that actually major changes have come from very often, very small, very determined people that manage to change the culture through struggle, through disobedience. But that's actually it's it's people who find the strength and actually believe in their own uh, capacity and their own power that change comes so yes get get together because that's the thing is that you can't do it on your own that's right yeah. and we met in a situation just like this oh really Ooh. in a panel yeah, or a, a I, lecture I, I was on the panel and Isa was translating ah okay cool <laughs> I saw somebody's hand go up. I love this. I this has never happened. Normally, I have like, I have a whole like structure for after conversation. I don't need it. This is great. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Yeah, it inspires so much. I've been disobeying the system since I was eleven, so it gives like a little spark again because I went back to school just to understand the system, how it functions and, and what feelings you have in this kind of metropolis. Um, but I was just wondering, because the fact that I don't continue this, this energy of disobedience is, 
how you deal with, as a collective or individually, with the negative emotions that come with disobedience. For example, the fact that you are confronted with police brutality, or the fact that, um, yeah, just, just some things are happening that you feel very disconnected to a certain kind of life you had, or, or the people who surround you, the people who you love, like your parents or your friends being out there. And yeah, you feel this deep disconnection at a certain point. And this is what I wonder, like, how you deal with those, those kind of emotions as an individual and as a collective. Um, I think being, being with people who are like-minded and share experience uh, and that you feel that you can talk through those emotions uh, openly and transparently is really important. And that's, I think, exactly what you were talking about when you were talking about the culture of care, is, is to actually also um, fight this, what can be this activist armor of, you know, you, you disobey and you're strong and you're not scared and uh, you know, and you can deal with you know police violence shit. And even more after a while, it becomes a badge of honor. And people who are scared of the cops are a bit like, mm, you're scared of the cops. I'm not. It's actually to accept one's own vulnerability and to be able to talk about it and to accept that sometimes it gets you down. And and it's not because it gets you down that you'll remain down, but that to actually go with those emotions rather than fight them off, I think is really, is really, really important. And, and yeah, I think that the, the, the culture of care that you described is caring for each other and caring for oneself and being very open, it seems to me is one of the ways to, to not reproduce the very, very um, common cycle of burnout that you know the activist world uh, is kind of being destroyed by. It's mm -hmm. like there are generations, entire generations of people who go towards um, movements and participate and are elated and then are exhausted because because it is also hard. I mean, we are propagandists. So we're like, yay, disobedience, we're good, it's really fun. It's sometimes it's actually also really, really hard. And and I think that our movements are not are not very good yet at having this culture of care. And I think that this is this is how you move through it. Well I would just add, I mean it's not the importance is not to see it as a personal problem, but it's actually a social and structural problem that you're part of it's not just you who are not you know not strong enough or whatever it's it, um and that you know we all change i mean i had a massive burnout to that's kind of been going on four years which is also linked to my transition and stuff um and uh took me out of organized i can't organize anymore i can't organize big actions so suddenly all my identity went uh but um the important thing for me to always remember was, uh, well, actually, you know, it's only one, well, 99.9% .9 of people don't want to be on the front line. They don't necessarily want to disobey or uh, fight the police or whatever, or lock on to an oil refinery. Uh, but those people need a culture of resistance. Those people don't exist. It's only in a very patriarchal society that sees them as the kind of frontline heroes. And we forget that actually they don't exist without all the care, all the people look after the kids, all the people that do the food, all the people that do the legal work, all the people that do the cultural work around it. All that culture of resistance is super important. So when, you know, so I kind of personally was able to go, okay, well, I'm not organizing mass actions now. I'm even, I, I even my relationship to adrenaline has completely shifted. I hate adrenaline now. I was, I, adrenaline was my was my fuel for like 30 years. Um, and uh, now I'm like, okay, but it's fine. We're doing the ritual, we're doing the healing, we're doing the regenerative activist stuff. That's part of the culture and it's just as important. And so I think, yeah, that's, and that's also part of shifting from a kind of very 
extractivist culture of, you know, we're just going to burn people out, whether that's in their job or in activism, we're just going to burn them out and then start again. Well, I think what I'd like to add to that, though, to that sort of the question of um, repressive violence and sort of the risks people take when they disobey, um, I think in some of that frame, that paradigm also somehow invisibilizes the many, many violences that lead people to the point where they have to disobey, right? I think that there is uh, there's a kind of like underlying violence around us constantly that we, that we just don't see as violence anymore. Um, for example, uh, the fact that art as we know it, as it's practiced now, that it involves extracting a particular uh, artist and or their objects or performances and taking them out of the context in which uh, they've created, the community that inspired it, the, <laughs> the communities that, uh, that uh, uh, nurtured this person or their objects and taking them out and putting them in a museum. But that is a violence that we don't see as violence anymore, right? <laughs> um, I find the notion of microaggression, I think, is really interesting. The notion, I don't know if people are familiar with this concept of microaggression. Um, the fact that uh, it was mostly developed in the, in the women's movement where they acknowledged the ways in which women on a, a sort of like almost daily basis are sort of denigrated and humiliated in tiny little ways and all these little forms of violence, just walking into a store and the commercials you see and all that sort of the tiny little attacks on your self-esteem and your your dignity, um, but that's, we, we, we call it microaggression while it's just aggression, right? Um, because there's just so much violence that we don't see. The fact that we can, I repeat this example always, the fact that we can walk in any given supermarket now and only 20% of objects in the supermarkets are fair trade, meaning the 80% is not fair trade, that it is stolen, like it's unfair trade, and that we don't see that as extremely alarming form of violence. Um, I think kind of, I think for me it's like the barricade, the, the police violence is framed as the ultimate violence of oppression or so on, while there's so many other forms of violence that we've become insensitive to. Yeah. Anyways, I saw someone here. Yes, um, thanks for uh, your talk, uh, really interesting. Um, I, th I think there's a really clear um, call to action to the artwork, um, like get out of your ivory tower, um, don't talk about change, but make change happen. Um, but I guess there's also a call to action towards activists or to social movements to, um, to be more creative maybe, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to put words on your, mu <laughs> your mouth. Um, and I was wondering, could you elaborate on like steps on how to, to or I don't know, like, uh, because what we see is that activists, they tend to do like the, the marches, the, the blockades. I mean, like even the blockades have become a bit of like a standard thing now. And in your work, we see a lot of like uh, alterations of these methods. Um, and I was wondering like, how did you, how, how did you get to these methods? Uh, I don't know. Question. Well, often it's it's about um, finding finding worlds that are going to have really um, interesting takes on something. So, for instance, when we did put the fun between your legs, become the bike block, uh, we got into the bike world, like bike geeks and geeks that's actually find the geeks in anything <laughs> and it's like the bikes the um like we did a, a big experiment that was called climate games where we worked with programmers or and i think that often it's bringing together um activists who have the rage the organizing skills the audacity the uh, but yeah, maybe a bit stuck in a rut of like reproducing the same forms and, and finding um, other, other worlds that are going to propose d 
different entry points and different forms. And that very often creates the kind of synergies that is going to help reinventing forms because it seems to us that that's one of the things that we need to do. Is that we, need to, we need to keep on trying to reinvent forms of life and forms of resistance and not, not try to find the thing that works and keep on doing it. It's like, that's not how life works. Life is not this thing, it's like, oh yeah, like you don't, you look at any kind of living being, it's not like, you're not gonna have a tree that says, oh, well, that's it, I'm a tree. I'm, I'm not doing anything anymore, or I keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's like, there is a sense of adapting to, to whatever comes. So yeah, that's what we try to, to do is to find worlds that can be these new environments for creativity to, uh, to emerge. Is, is that why you deserted from the clown army? Because it wasn't adapting anymore? Deserted from? Clown. The clown army. <laughs> Should I do that one? I'll, I'll let you um, <laughs> do the clown army bit. There's some old veterans in the, in the audience. It's very nice to see some veteran <laughs> clowns. Um, um, Am I bringing up something? No, no, it's fine. No, okay. we've, we've done the therapy. It's fine. We can talk about it. Um, um, so, well, it, 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 it's very linked to the, the question, in, in fact, because, no, it wasn't about adaptation, but, um, and that is key, and I think that is key generally in life, you know, and faced with the capitalist scene, thing we have to learn most is to how to change and adapt and, and accept change and and activism is so much in like action 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 uh, that there's very little space for reflection for thinking about experience for really you know coming up with new ideas to come up with new ideas you need space and that's we often talk about this edge between the time the the, the time of art and the time of activism so activism you know People are dying now, people are drowning in the Mediterranean now, the waters are rising now, the floods are coming now, we've got to act now. When's the next action? Action, action, act. Art World can do a residency for seven months, and then at the end you do a performance that lasts five seconds and you eat a tulip and no one cares. It's all fine. And, you know, somewhere you've got to find a middle ground. Um, and the problem with the clown army was that um, clowning, so uh, I discovered clowning partly through, uh, well, I'd done clowning as a theater student and then had read this amazing book by this kind of heretic anthropologist, uh, which basically says that the kind of Western theater tradition came and all culture, all popular culture, from theater to circus to clowns, to magic, to rock and roll, comes from basically unemployed shamans. Basically, that was a shamanic culture, uh, shamanism gets destroyed, and then uh, you uh, have these shamanic, these folk who are sh still shamans, and they're passing on their shamanic practices, but no one believes in the shamans anymore, no one knows what the shamans are doing, but they're still doing it, and that becomes theater, that becomes a spectacle, because the, the codes are lost, the meaning is lost. And I was really, uh, I, was a, I was a boy scout, so I was very inspired by Joseph Boyce and shamanism and stuff when I was an art student. And I read this in, in this book and it totally, I was like, we need to have an army of clowns um, because so many act, because also the clown is this totally feeling being. There's no armor on the clown and they feel everything. And I'd seen so many activists, and it was after Genoa in the, uh, where there was a massive police repression, and I saw so many activists building armor around themselves and just getting harder and harder and harder, and then being really shit at collective practices and then movement splitting and everything. And I was like, how do we open up the activists' heart again? And clowning seemed perfect. But the problem is, so it wasn't just, it had a kind of psychological element and it had the strategic tactical element of like going onto the street and using confusion rather than confrontation. Thing is, clowning is the hardest, one of the hardest performing arts in the world. It's like the marathon of theater in a way because you have to just 
empty everything, empty your ego, everything. And that requires a lot of time. And activists didn't have that time. So basically it was like, oh, you know, we'll put a red nose on and be stupid in the street and then we'll be a clown. And that is an aesthetic crime. Um, <laughs> and so we were responsible for pushing out an aesthetic crime. Uh, and I, I, well, I, I think I, when I die, I, I, mostly it was me, I'm sorry. I, I won't. <laughs> we just met at that time. And, um, uh, and I, uh, I think I will end up in purgatory and I will be tortured by very bad hippie clowns to the end of times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I do think it's really interesting that what you said about time and just the way that activism is about, somebody, uh, somebody I really care about a lot, somebody who's really a role model for me in, in activism, once told me there's a difference between mobilizing and organizing. So, so much of what we call activism now is really mobilizing, and that's masses. You're trying to get as many bodies, and the relationship of those bodies doesn't matter. You just need to get as many signatures, you need to get as many um, people to show up. You need to get as many likes, shares. It's like this mobilizing work. And, and, and that's, like that's also where the language of deadlines and urgencies and goals and targets come from in activism, while organizing is about relationships. It's about the quality of the relationship, not the mass volume of it. And for me, like some of the people that I've known who told me about clowning uh, in the queer movement, especially in Rotterdam, uh, we, we called ourselves the gender clowns. And uh, we brought in clowning as a way to sort of deepen and sort of, um, sort of really like, sort of accentuate that relationship. We weren't mobilizing as many queers as possible. Uh, we wanted to play. And we wanted to create spaces where being queer um, had depth, had relationality. And, uh, and I think that's something which, when you're talking about sort of the difference between sort of these activists who are on a, on a, on a deadline, who have timelines, and, who, and, and the artists who have all this time to relate and to think and to feel and to produce, uh, that really resonates. Yeah, playing could be, can be a really great way to access different temporal spaces very quickly, no? Yeah, we, we, do, we do use a lot of play in the in the workshops mm. we do for all for all these reasons also to uh, to fight the tendency that artists and activists can have to take themselves seriously and we feel that it's really important to to take what we do seriously but not take ourselves seriously um, but this time issue really is a head fuck and i think it's really important to also not pretend that it's an easy resolved one because actually when, when you are, I think that, you know, there is this growing sense of eco-anxiety, so much so that now it's also being turned into a bit of a, of a joke. But actually, I mean, I was reading today that in, in France, at least, 25% of, 20 of young people under 25 have depressive tendencies and that's 25 percent among young women and that's because there is a genuine sense of oh my god things are really scary and mm -hmm. they're scary because things are moving so fast and and i think that when you're an, an activist working with some really dire situations that where actually people are dying they're dying on the streets they're dying in the sea and you know, and you have some good intentioned person that says, oh yeah, no, but take your time to build your relationship. I mean, of course you want to hit them. It's mm. like, you know, and, and I think that this is what we need to find is how do we build the culture of care so that it doesn't feel that it's, that it's a choice to mm. make that is going to be at the expense of the work that needs doing. And because I think that that's, I mean, there's the consequences of disobeying, but I think that that is one of the main sources of burnout, is that, that head fuck, literally, is that how do I do the work that needs doing without exhausting myself, without exhausting people around me? How mm. do we 
find that. And I think that that's, as Jay was saying, is that it needs to be something that we do collectively. Mm. It's like when you try to sort that equation out by yourself, it's too hard. And I, think, I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible to do it by yourself. Uh, and there's lots of research now that's showing that actually if through trauma, and the more you keep the trauma to yourself, the more you don't express it, actually it, the, you know, the chances of autoimmune diseases and depression, that you know, it, it's all there in the body and, and you know, it's, it's, it's so necessary to actually express it, express you know, to others. And it comes back to this idea of you, know, you are only yourself through connection with the others. And our system is so atomized and there's this kind of existential individualism that's pushed all the time, all the time. I find it, what you're saying here, I find it really interesting about that sort of, that collectivity, but also where the trauma is taking place. When we're thinking of climate, um, the climate crisis we're in, I think that there is like different ways in which we're talking about this. And one of the ways is to say, the harm is taking place somewhere else, right? So, you know, like the, the, the pollution, the, 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 the climate refugees, it's all gonna come from somewhere else. Um, and we need to save them. That's also the second one, the kind of like, we need to preserve pristine rainforests, we need to save the orang utans and so on. But both those things, kind of end up with, it's not here, it's not us. We're not the ones uh, who have been harmed. We're not the ones who are fearing, experiencing trauma. But what I find really interesting about your work is, and also like the Zad, which you can read all about in this book, which are for sale here today. <laughs> I'm such a great saleswoman. Um, is that you went and did all that work here in Europe. You collectivized here in Europe. Not, you didn't go to some indigenous uh, lands and tribes. No, you did that all in France. You can all take a train to it quite easily. Uh, and I'm kind of curious about that. Like, so where is the harm? And where are we supposed to do this work of collectivizing and of, can we do it here in Ghent? Or do we also need to go to an outside of the metropole? <laughs> You can do it anywhere, of course. Um, and it's interesting you say that because actually all our, a lot of our inspirations, of course, were fr from elsewhere. I mean, notably the Zapatistas for us, that was in a sense. So I just out of interest, if I say Zapatista, just raise your hands, people who know what that means when I say it. Wow, okay, that's pretty good. Okay, indigenous, that is really, that's given me hope, thank you. Uh, indigenous uprising um, in Chiapas in Mexico, uh, which changed the face of radical resistance in the 90s uh, and really pushed this idea that the world, that we need diversity, that diversity and difference is, is the richness of a, of a new world and that we had to resist and show alternatives at the same time and you could use poetic languages and so on. And, and uh, so we were super inspired by the Zapatistas and the movement Sentera, the landless peasants movements in Brazil and everything. And we were always, well, you know, that's very well, but that's not here and what's here. And that's why we did the book and the travel in Europe actually mm. was like, well, what is there here? Because it's there. And the, the beauty of doing the research for that book and the film was like, we, w we had seven months because we took sabbaticals and in our relationship, uh, I'm the one who always wants to do everything. Uh, and he's is always the one who brings us to something that's vaguely realistic. And that's why we work super well together. Um, and so I wanted to go to like 30 different collectives, which was like, you know, would be like the tourist version of Pass Through Utopia, it's like between five minutes in each one. And he was like, we only need to go to, you know, whatever, 11 we did in the end. But what was incredible is that when we started doing the research, we just found loads and loads and loads. And there were collectives and living collectives all over Europe that you never hear about. Um, so I think it's also about you know, making these experiments visible. Uh, and they are everywhere. And I'm sure there are some exciting things happening.
in this territory, which some people in the audience can share with other people. Really? Q. <laughs> we did have two people in the who wanted to, and we have very few minutes left. So, but I don't know if there are going to be examples of of uprisings happening in Ghent. Maybe there are. Maybe well, actually, knows. there's a link, very strong link with the Zad and Bru There was a in near Bruges. There was a protest in the trees against. Can anyone remember the name of it? Okay, so key people from there were some of the first people on the Zad in Notre Dame de Land. Mm. So there's a direct link. Some of the first 10 people on the Zad were from that struggle in Ghent. So <laughs> go. <with that>. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have two, two people, right? Do you and. Yeah, you have one. Uh, so I wanted to just ask uh, about the tools for making trust in collective spaces. I mean, how do you build trust? Because when, when I just uh, saw your everything that you did, I thought it very precious, but I was like, oh, if I was in front of you and I was like, oh, come to build a new world, I was like, uh, I don't know, there is some trust that we need to build before I engage myself into building a new world, I guess. So I was wondering how do you do that and how do you, how are the tools that you use to build the trust in the collective? Hmm. Shall we take, shall, there, was, there was a second question. Shall we take that as well? Because we have very, very few minutes left. And me and Michael have been, have this three year long like agreement that we stop okay. on time right. so that he can go and have a life. Okay. I never actually stop on time. It's, shh, don't tell you. <laughs> we take two. <laughs> We've got the last question. I we know, it's kind of <laughs> precious, kind of on. <laughs> uh, I kind of want to ask a bit about uh, place and the quote that you said about inhabiting a place or a space to resist. And I was wondering about um, the role of, of cities in the way you kind of imagine and live resistance as both places where a lot of power is concentrated and of places where a lot of connections that are not necessarily only exploitative exist between different social groups. And um, yes, places that are like a very lived reality of a really big part of people in Europe and like the world. In the world. Yeah, in the world. The world is becoming a big city. Okay. Okay, two. We Sorry. Have, <laughs> we have one and a half minutes to answer <laughs> and trust. Easy. Um, no, but I mean, I think that there is one thing that we probably don't say enough in the presentation is that this idea about territorialize and inhabiting and because I think that it's obvious to us and it should not be obvious in the current times is that this should not be in as an opposition to the right to um, to move and I think because in the in the fascist, you know, rising everywhere. I think that it can be also used in in a very different way to what we are reaching because it's, I think that we were very uh, marked by the Zapatistas that were very much about, you know, know where you're from to be able to reach out and to connect. And I think that that's really important that it should never become this kind of, uh, jingoistic, you know, I'm from here and no one should come. Um, I think that it's like we I think that we denounce the the hyper mobility as a, a value of the upper middle class, certainly not the right to not have fucking borders. Um, and I think that, I mean, we don't really agree with this, right? the, the question on the city, because I want to believe that it's possible to actually inhabit places in cities as well, just because prosaically we can't have right now, we can't, like we can't have everyone from the cities moving to the countryside because that doesn't work because then we have cities in the countryside. And what we need to find are ways to dismantle the metropolis as ways of being, as ways of relating, in ways of um, thinking um, and I think that, that I want to believe that it can be done through collective endeavors and cooperatives and you know, shared gardens and what have you. Like, and that is what dismantles the metropolis. 
Um, and I think that through the question around uh, trust, I think it's a gamble. Most of the time, trust is a gamble. And in a lot of our experiments, we open up the we open up worlds, and we we have tools that involve a lot of games, and and we try to really take the time to actually build relationship and build a group uh, together, um, and not just dive into doing doing things, but actually take the time to do that. But like really, it, in the end, I think that is also gambling on the fact that people are not necessarily there to fuck you over, but that it's worth trusting and that our experience is that we've had had so few disappointments and so uh, many amazing experiences by trusting people that it's always worth it, I feel. But trust is a really interesting um, thing. What do you call trust? Emotion? Is it an emotion? I don't know. What do you call trust? Anyway, thing. It's a really interesting thing, process, because it's fundamentally reciprocal. 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 It's fundamentally reciprocal. Uh, because I, I can only trust you if you trust me. I mean, it's really one of these things that only works when two of you are involved in making the work to make it happen. In a sense, it can't. I, it can't just be one person who trusts another person, and that I find super interesting. And and it's as he says, it's about space and time. It's about what uh, in a very very beautiful book called Joyful Militancy, uh, where they talk about rigid radicalism. So much radical movements are super super rigid uh, and pure, and they go for purity. They go for this, you know, and they not don't adapt to situations changing, and that breaks a lot of trust. I think, you know, the lack of trust can often be because people are too fixed in some kind of way of thinking and feeling or acting in a certain situation, and not open to change, not open to be adapt to, to adapt. Often, I think it comes from a fear of change that that the kind of trust, uh, uh, and in the end, I think it's about warmth, and I think that I learned from. Joseph Boyce, uh, it was like, you know, the idea that communism is about warmth, and warmth is about melting things, uh, to, so they change, and conviviality, and I think we can create activist spaces which have that kind of deep warmth, and we're much more likely to have deep trust. How beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well... Okay, uh, I have this. I'm sorry, I'm a bit moved by what you just said. Uh, we have a question from the online spaces. Uh, we don't have time for it, but I'm just going to throw it in there. Maybe we have a quick. I'm moved by what you just said. That's very beautiful. You said disobedience leads to progress. To take an excessive example, if I go on a killing spree, that is disobedience. But you couldn't call that progress, right? This proves that there has to be a line. When does protest become a riot? Often. Uh, if it's often, done right. Often, <laughs> hopefully. I <laughs> definitely would not equate riot with killing spree. I think that we need to be careful about um, confusions. Um, you know, of course, we're talking about disobedience with ethics and to actually try to move towards a more just, convivial, uh, reciprocal relationships. And it's, like, and it's not to say disobedience per se is, um, is a good thing. I think that's, yeah, no, that would be a bit vacuous. Mm. It's, I think that it was mostly a, a clip to actually say it, we need to remember that what is what is legal is not necessarily legitimate, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of that's the kind of disobedience we're talking about. And that is not to say that as soon as you disobey, what you're doing is becomes legitimate. And it's like it's legitimate that it's if it's 
pushing things towards more, more justice, more regenerative life. Uh, that's what it's about. So yes, of course, there needs to be a line. Yes. Mm. And, and that line is, is difficult to set and it's, and it's forever moving and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's the same. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not fixed. It's never fixed. And that is what is beautiful and frustrating as mm. life is. I needed to be quick, so... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, sorry, Mikhail. Uh, I am so grateful for both of you. Uh, you. I am also really grateful for the people, for that you, I mean, you're, I think that in my position, I get to also become friends with some of the people we invite here, and I am very much looking forward to continuing to be friends with you and read your thoughts and watch your work and possibly squat your house, your farm <laughs> in France. <laughs> I'm going to do all those things. Uh, so I want to thank you so, so much. Uh, I also want to thank you all for uh, making my job very easy tonight. Uh, very, very, very glad that we could offer uh, such a reciprocal and warm uh, audience uh, tonight for Isa and AJ. So give yourselves, all of you, a round of applause and also to thank Isa and JJ. Awesome. <laughs> Where can people buy these books? These these can be bought here. Can be bought um, here. And otherwise, it's sold by Pluto Press. Yeah, I honestly think you should get one of your own. I I, I love my copy. Uh, I got sent one uh, by mail. And I've absolutely destroyed it so many times I've read this. It's, it's really, there's, it, there, there's a story here that I think, um, you know, one of the many stories of resistance, successful resistance here in Europe that are taking place, decolo decolonial struggles, I find, um, that we need to know about. You will not find this uh, at uh, RTBF uh, anytime soon. L unlikely to find it at your favorite YouTuber. No, this is stuff that really only gets known by passing them around. So buy it, read it, and then pass it on. Because people need to know about this. It's happening now. Thank you. Let's go.